the, the voiceover tells us that the recording was successful. So hello everyone and welcome to the June 2021 Jupiter Community Call. Woohoo! That means we're halfway through this year. So congrats on making it and having the time to be here. I love to see everyone's faces and what we're going to be up to. So hooray! For context, for anyone who's new or stumbled into this by accident somehow, this is a place where we try and connect across communities, understand what cool things people are doing. It's kind of like a big show and tell where people are like, I'm excited about this, I made this thing, or somebody else made this, and it really helped me out. So it's here to help us stay connected across projects in Jupiter and just get excited for the work we're doing. Also, you already heard it, community calls are recorded though. They are posted on YouTube if you ever need to catch up or you're just curious, or if you love a share and want to go back and figure out what was the name of that cool project someone shared five months ago. Uh, there, also remember, this is a Jupiter community event. Like all other Jupiter community events, we are held to that code of conduct that you can find anytime at jupiter.org slash conduct. Um, that includes me, in case that's needed for any reason. And what we're going to do is follow the agenda, which I can link again if anyone needs. And that means we're going to be starting with just the quick shares, which these are like announcements that people might have that just take a moment like this was released or this. So I think we have one on there from Frederick, actually. So ready to go? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was adding a last minute bullet. <laughs> Um, so, because uh, people have pinged uh, me about it, I'm just telling that uh, Plotly v5 uh, for Python has been released uh, with a major change for JupyterLab integration in the sense that no federated extension. So that means you just have to pip install or conda install the package and you will have the extension inside JupyterLab without anything else to do. Another nice thing is that there is only one package in the front end now. And the last main change that I did, um, so I'm not part of Proti guy, um, is to be able to load the, the library uh, in a lazy way. So that's mean that if you are not using Protly, but it's installed, you won't uh, download the JavaScript library inside JupyterLab up to the point you really need it. Um, and the other point is that, oh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, with the help of Stephen, I learned how to make release of JupyterLab. So we just released uh, JupyterLab v3.1 beta zero. And uh, if people want to try it, go ahead. Uh, there is nice features coming in, like uh, real-time collaboration. The debugger is coming also with uh, iPad kernel v6. Uh, so th there is quite new stuff and there is also enhancement for the, the interface and stuff like that. So don't hesitate to, to try it and report any bug before we, we do the final release and hopefully in next month or something like that. <laughs> so that was all for me. Thanks, Isabella. Thank you. That's awesome. I love hearing about releases and great Jupiter stuff, which by the way, when that does go out, the feedback is very much wanted to reiterate what Frederick said. So please, that would be awesome to know what y'all are thinking. I'm the next one on the short reports, actually. I linked to a Jupiter discourse, yeah, discourse issue where uh, I just for full disclosure have been asked to give a five minute discussion of what's happening with all the Jupiter projects at SciPy. And uh, I want to make sure that I know what's happening, because even though I try and stay cross community, it's not like I see everything. So if people have things that they want in the pool for potentially being brought up, that would be great if you could add that there, just so I'm aware, because I definitely don't know everything that's happening here. So that's my little thing. But I think we have some more reports after me now. It's Nick or Jeremy next. Well, nobody spoke up, so I guess that's me. Um, so we uh, we soft released uh, Jupiter Lite, the CLI package. Uh, I broke the packaging because total rook amateur here. Sorry. Um, so it doesn't have a readme on PyPy, but what are you going to do? Um, anyhow, with that now, you don't have to hand build the federated extensions. You don't have to hand build contents. It will do all that junk for you. 
Um, you just, you know, Jupyter Lite build in a directory, and now you got a static site that you can host. Um, and since the last time we showed it, we got uh, real uh, IPy widget support, like up to Plotly and and uh, and BQ Plot and Leaflet. Uh, Py three G Py three JS is hard, um, so we didn't quite get there yet because uh, of nested buffer binary things. Um, but uh, making a lot of strides there. The RTC stuff is looking kind of insane. Um, so you know. More good stuff is coming. Workspaces going to hit that. Uh, going to figure out how to grab stuff straight out of wheels. And until Conda Forge comes along and gives us, you know, a WASM target, we're going to have a lot more uh, work to do to, to patch existing Python stuff so that it runs in the browser. But um, this is really good stuff, guys. Uh, this is this is going to. I mean, this is how we get Jupiter to the next billion people um, that have a Chromebook or whatever because. Uh, you know, in 2021, it's still really hard to install Python, and uh, this is really gonna this is really gonna move things forward. Um, another clever thing it has is uh, it can do reproducible builds, um, at least if you're not on, win on Windows. I don't know why. I haven't looked into what magic junk it's putting in there, but uh, if you run Jupyter Lab Archive and you give it a source date epoch, you will get exactly the same site out, um, given the same input, which is kind of nuts because you know reproducible builds are hard. Um, so anyhow, no demo because it's the same thing as last time. It's just you can build your own now, uh, and we're going to be working on some Sphinx integration and stuff so that it's even easier to get that stuff built and published on a good web host. Um, yeah, that's all. Fantastic. More awesome release news and more super cool things to play with when we have time. I look forward to probably the future demos as things continue to get more wild over there. So thank you. Uh, what about, oh, we have Kevin next. Would you like to speak? Sure, thank you. Um, I just want to let folks know that the kernel provisioning pull request is ready for review. Um, kernel provisioning essentially abstracts out the, the P open layer that the kernel manager interacts with the kernel process with and um, allows uh, a pluggable interface to um, bring your own uh, provisioning provisioner um, if you will so that you could launch kernels into different environments um, within the existing Jupyter framework um, so it's, it's essentially just a process uh, layer a process interaction layer so if, if folks would like to review it I'd appreciate um, the comments and we'll we'll move forward from there thank you that's wonderful and thank you for doing that i know you spend a lot of time in um, projects with with less community members around them so appreciate you keeping things running thank you yeah. and we have more oh, i love seeing all these announcements you all are doing so much congrats on that we have loik Yes. Uh, sorry, I wasn't there at the latest JupyterLab meetings. I was kind of busy lately, but things are still uh, still running up. I mean, we are still working on things. And notably, um, the, we have a new release for JupyterLab H5 Web, which is landing this week. It is not released yet, but we hope to, to make it this week. So for those who don't know, I already presented this at a previous JupyterLab community call. But JupyterLab H5 Web is an extension to explore HDA5 files, which are files where basically there is a whole file system in there. And uh, for those who know HDA5 files, sometimes you can have issues where, with uh, external link that links to other files and compression of the data sets that are, uh, that are contained in such files. And uh, the latest uh, release should address these issues and uh, bringing the support for these features. And also, um, we are also bringing, um, so the extension is based on the web viewer, which is called H5 web. And we are adding a lots, lots of features of visualization into this web viewer. And uh, the next release of the extension should uh, bring also these new visualization features inside the extension. So there is lots of stuff that is uh, going in this release. And uh, I hope that it will interest people that are looking at uh, HDA5 file in JupyterLab or elsewhere. 
That's fantastic. It's been awesome to hear all the updates from that project. So maybe one day we'll see another demo with all the cool new tricks after. So yeah, yeah maybe. Thanks. <laughs> Possibly. No pressure there, please. But yeah, we now have Nick or Mike. We have options again. Choose your own adventure uh, short report. Go ahead. And I don't, uh, kind of hard to tell who's here, but anyhow. Uh, so Mike and I have been uh, working the uh, language server protocol integration for Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Server for some time now. Uh, I don't even remember. And uh, it's you know it's pretty good, uh, but we're ready to graduate it out of uh, uh, Mike's personal repo and and start really moving forward. Um, it's going to have impacts on a lot of places. I have a feeling um, because you know it's a whole. You know, four times as many more messages than uh, than Jupyter kernel messaging. Um, so, if anybody's got feedback on that, that would be super welcome as to what you might do with it, or uh, how you might be able to use it in your project or your product. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's it's kind of a uh, I don't know. It's it's a community driven spec, but kind of not really. Uh, there's that organization that I see a lot of attendees here today from that, you know, they're kind of, kind of holding it close. So, uh, we're trying to get to something where, you know, we can more broadly embrace it across a bunch of projects. Um, we've got a bunch of, you know, a lot of good stuff to see there if you haven't seen it before. Um, and it's just, there's a lot of tricky bits on, on making all that stuff work correctly for everybody's use cases. Um, that is all. Woohoo! I hope you get some good feedback since that's going to have a lot of impacts. And finally, we have Matt. Yay! If you're speaking, Matt, I can't see. I can't hear you at all. Oh, there you are. Give it a second here. I was using the wrong mic. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. All right, so I had two things. The JEP one reminded me there's a JEP to, to look at as well. Um, so nbconvert 6.1.0 um, have been sitting there and a bunch of um, community members had submitted different PRs and then there was kind of a poke for, hey, it's been eight months, which is basically from when, <laughs> right before I had my daughter, um, since anyone did a release for nbconvert. So uh, I tried to put together as best I could some testing and, and make sure everything was smooth and did an RC for a week and a half or two weeks. Um, to see if everything got there and got some test fixes. If I haven't had anyone report like major issues, I think all the stuff went through pretty cleanly. But if you do see something there, uh, do raise an issue. Um, I'd say the biggest thing that repo needs, by the way, is, is people to help make example docs and upgrade the example docs like MB convert examples, for example, is uh, 5.x, not 6.x patterns. And no one has updated those. And some of the documentation could be better about how to do custom um, templates and I just haven't had a lot of time to put into that. Um, that's the thing I was looking at what like needs the most attention in that repo. So if anyone does have a little time to help with some of the documentation there that's familiar, I uh, would love to have some help on that. And then there's a um, uh, JEP that's been sitting for a while, probably ready to go at this point, but not everyone has kind of taken a look. So if you want to, um, thanks for making that a link. Uh, if you want to take a look at um, the proposal to transmit cell metadata on uh, execute request. That's been up for a couple months. Uh, we should probably look at like wrapping that up or getting final feedback on it. So if the folks here could give a look at that so we could move that forward uh, and feel a little more confident, that'd be great. I could talk more to what that one does if people want. To be clear to people, those are your seconds of silence for for asking questions. All right. Well, that's my update. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I I'm loving hearing about all these releases today. So glad to have another one. And always, we need Doc's help. So <laughs> a good call to call for that as well. Uh, this, I'm going to give a few more seconds if anybody else has, oh, that reminded me of this short report, and then we can move on, but here we go. Okay, then. 
thank you so much for all those great reports. And it's big uh, agenda item time now. So with no further ado, if you're ready to go, Eduardo, it would be so exciting to see what you have for us today. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Absolutely. Cool. Uh, well, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about the project I've been working on. Um, it's called Bloomberg. And the idea is to help data scientists build production ready pipelines from Jupyter. So this is the GitHub repo and I'm going to show a demo, which I think it's more exciting. So um, this is the idea we have, um, we, are, we want to build a, a data science pipeline. So usually the way it works uh, with some teams is that they build everything in a single notebook and then it's really hard to manage, right? If you have a notebook that has 1000 cells, uh, you break something, it's really hard to, to fix it. So the idea with Bloomberg is that it, it allows you to break down that gigantic Jupyter notebook into small parts uh, that then you can test separately and that some, like more than one person can collaborate in different parts. So what I have here is a JAML file, which is the way you declare a pipeline. So we can see um, that this pipeline has four tasks. So first important thing is that these are scripts that open as notebooks. So I'm gonna show one of the scripts in this uh, pipeline, which is the get, a script that just gets some data so I can open it as a notebook. Um, why why is, uh, is this the case? Well, sometimes it's, uh, well, it's, it's really hard to do code reviews with Jupyter notebooks. So the idea here is that you simply use the scripts, uh, you work on them, um, and then you can do code reviews and do like git diff and all those things. But when you execute this script, it's going to generate a notebook as an output. So you kind of separate your source code from your output, and this helps with code reviews. Now, that's the first important thing. Uh, the second important thing is how do you concatenate different scripts or notebooks into a pipeline? I'm going to create a diagram of this pipeline to show uh, the relationships between these four scripts. So now I have this diagram. So I can, I'm gonna move this here. And I have four scripts, so I am getting some data. Then I am, this is a simple machine learning pipeline, really basic using the IDS data set. So I get some data and then I generate some features, uh, some feature A, feature B, join everything and train a model, right? So how do we uh, establish these relationships? Uh, it's really simple, so let me open one script that has um, a dependency. So I'm gonna open feature A. So if I go and open feature A, I'll see that I have this upstream variable and I can say, for example, here I'm saying, I want to use the output from get as an input. So I simply have to say get, I put the name of the task and then when I reload the, the file, so actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. So if I set this to none, and then reload the file. Uh, the, the, um, so this is how you would start, right? You have a, a, a script, and then you say, well, I want to use an output from a previous task as input. So I say, I want to use get. So I save, and if I reload again, I'll see this new, new code, which is saying, well, you want to use get as input now, here you have the output from that file. And then I can simply execute my thing without having to, oh, I didn't, I didn't run the previous task, so I don't have the actual output. I'll just do that so this thing works. So let's say I want to get some data. I open the first task, uh, generate some data frame. I'm missing one folder here. So I'll just create one output. Okay, all right, now I save the out for my first task. And now I can continue on a separate notebook using that output and then I can run my thing here. So this is kind of like the interactive experience. How can I build something from small notebooks and then I can run the whole thing from the command line and say, just run every notebook. Um, like this is essentially the experience. Uh, you separate your logic in a script you break down in small scripts, your orchestrate execution, and then you can do other nice things like parallelizing independent tasks. For example, here I can run these two tasks in parallel, 
or you can even, uh, with some little extra configuration, you can run this thing in the cloud. Uh, so we currently support Airflow, AWS Batch, and Kubernetes using our workflows. Uh, so the idea is that you don't have to move back and forth between uh, writing a notebook, then copying, copy pasting that code to an Airflow um, DAG. Uh, you can simply write it here, and then you can export your work and run it in production. Um, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you for a demo. And I, I don't know, I love seeing when things kind of break and seeing how people fix them. So I find that informative. But questions or comments from others? And if no one does, then I do. I, I mean, okay. I have a question. Um, so you specify the dependency of your pipeline in the script, right? Uh, I was kind of surprised because usually in the YAML file in CI pipeline, pipeline and things like that, you specify the dependency in the YAML, right? Yeah, so that's the default option. That's a, that's a great point. That's the default option. Uh, you can specify the dependencies in the YAML file itself. Okay. Uh, but when, when, when talking to users, we found out that this is um, kind of simpler. Uh, I, I guess it, it has to do with the thought process, right? You open, you open a script and then you think, what am I going to use as input here? Mm, I see. Uh, but you can change that option. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. Can I ask what inspired like this particular approach? I know people have done workflow things in a lot of different ways. So I'm curious what, what made you and the rest of your team from looking at the repo? Um, I think so kind of this project has been going on for, uh, more than one year. So actually the first version didn't support notebooks at all. Uh, it kind of evolved from being like a SQL Python functions approach. And then at some point we thought, well, for some tasks in the pipeline, we usually need a Jupyter notebook because it just makes exploration so much easier. Mm. And that's one thing, data exploration. The second thing is when we train models, we want some report, right? We want some evaluation metrics or some tables. And then we thought, well, actually the Jupyter format is great because we can have a single file that has everything that we need. So if we run something in the cloud, we just get this Jupyter notebook back and we can take a look at the model evaluation um, report. So that, can, that's, that was kind of the inspiration. And then people started using it as a Jupyter notebook centric tool. So we started working on that. And, and I think it's been, uh, we have received great feedback from a couple of companies that are using it and think that this is really helping them organize their pipelines because data scientists no longer have to copy paste between notebooks. They can just write something in a notebook and then um, they can move it to production without having to rebuild or refactor the whole thing. Well, that was a great explanation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Luciano, did you, did you want to say your comment? I was just going to ask Eduardo if he, he was aware of Elira. Uh, so we, we, we have a similar approach, but we uh, basically doing most of the, the workflow uh, visually. Uh, uh, and, and I think in terms of backends is similar. We support Airflow. Uh, we support uh, Argo and uh, Tecton via uh, KFP. So um, uh, just take a look, might be some uh, synergies there that we can uh, work on, on integrations, so. Yeah, absolutely. I know about Lyra. I watched a JupyterCon presentation. Uh, so I think it's a great project. Yeah, definitely there's a lot of similarities. So maybe we can chat offline to see how we can collaborate. Sure. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, I thought that was someone. <laughs> I thought that was someone turning on their mic to speak, but I guess not. Can I actually ask one more thing though? You've been talking a little bit about user feedback. Is that just through, um, I don't know. I'm curious how you're getting that. That's always interesting to me in open source projects because sometimes people get it easily and yeah. sometimes they don't. It's been from different channels. I would say um, some people just op uh, open issues on the GitHub repo. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the most engaged users just sent me emails with lots of questions. So then uh, I think that's great because you kind of start building this uh, relationship with users that maybe are afraid to ask, like they think dumb questions 
uh, on a public public space. Uh, so that's been great. And I sometimes talk to them like on Zoom or, in, or, or anything, like I keep in touch with them to understand what's going on, how they are using it. And I think I mean, it's an exciting point for this project because the next release that we make is gonna be entirely driven by users' feedback. So we are no longer thinking, well, I think this is going to solve a certain problem. We are actually asking users and then fixing things. And that's how we are um, like kind of building the next uh, features. That's so, that's so nice to hear, music to my ears. Well, congrats on that, that's amazing. Thank you. I don't think there are any more comments, so I'll leave a moment yeah, again. Uh, I just oh, have yeah. one last question yeah. that uh, was brought up, but what you were saying. Uh, do you have an idea of the demography, let's say, of your users? Uh, what are they doing with this tool? Um, mostly machine learning or things like that? Yeah, so I, the, the, so the, the set of users that I know more about is a company in the US, uh, like healthcare company, healthcare technology company. Um, they are doing, so right now there are only a few people at that company using it, but they want to expand it to like data scientists who mostly use Jupyter for, for, for work. Uh, I think they are mostly using machine learning pipelines. Um, they are probably going to expand to maybe some like analytics, um, but mostly machine learning. And I think it also has to do with the kind of community that I've been um, like speaking to, which, which has been mostly machine learning, but definitely, and, and also most of the examples are machine learning pipelines. But, um, there's nef definitely room for some other uh, use cases. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks everyone for a great discussion and thank you for Eduardo for taking the time to demo and show up. It's, I love seeing new demos. I love seeing new people. So welcome, welcome to our community more formally. I don't know if this is formal. But yeah, thank you. Thank you and thanks for all the questions. Are we ready to move on to the talk that, according to the notes at least, is about to be given by a bird, though I have a feeling it's Nick? Or maybe Tony, you know? I don't know now. Whoever has the next item on the list, since you did not. It is me. not me. Okay. And <laughs> we can't hear Tony. Tony, okay. we cannot hear you. Plug and replug. Use your clapper. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification for, for your Amazon or something. So with some tap dancing music while he was working with stuff, Pidgey is a uh, evolution of um, some literate programming stuff that we built uh, primarily for for doing presentations and demos. Um, jump in at any time, Tony. Nope, you can't jump in. He's still silent. I can't hear him. Uh, but he's he's cursing. It's kind of funny watching it actually. No, like, no. Ears smoking. It's, yeah. um, <laughs> and so it's you know it it's been it's been guided by failure driven development. Basically, can you take the idea that markup has that you can't write broken markdown, um, and apply that to writing code and documents wow. that are interactive? There we go. I have a microphone. Oh my god. I'm so sorry. Thanks for thanks for keeping that balloon in the air, Nick. It was good. I'm, you know, anybody who advocates for Pidgey is uh, destined to be uh, made fun of. Um, but I need everybody to open up their minds, forget all the shit you hate about notebooks, and just let's think into the future a little bit, please. So, like Nick said, um, we actually have been so Pidgey is a project that Deathbeds has been working on for an exceptional long time. Uh, it's never been quite right, but it's always been quite fun. Um, so one of the more recent uh, talks that we gave, uh, this one was super fun, wasn't it, Nick? The 10 pounds of shit talk, um, where uh, we basically spent a lot of time comparing uh, the Jupiter community to uh, playing around uh, as if computing were skate parks. So we start talking about these computational skate park ideas. And when we're giving these presentations, you know, it really becomes like a multimedia collage at some point. And what we're really doing is we're combining code and narrative together um, to tell stories, right? So uh, if you look at this, this is an example of an old Pidgey version that we've used, but it's Markdown. There's indented code, and then there's more Markdown. The indented code gets executed, 
uh, the rest of the markdown gets shown. Um, so from one cell, we can make a lovely little composition of exploring communities of practice and skate park architecture and open source and computational architecture. So it's really fun for composition. Uh, we actually have some places where uh, we put some graphs in here. Um, we've got some uh, images and tons of, tons of fun stuff. But um, this is how we've used it in practice. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about the current state of things. Um, so before I get going, uh, I want to talk that Nick mentioned the idea of the failure of code, right? So if I were to, in the notebook, and I type print 10, um, and I didn't have my parenthesis here, uh, I should get an error, right? So what we notice is that the code cell um, is actually being rendered as a piece of markdown. If we tab it in and we run it, now we get errors. Uh, that's not the right error, but we still get errors. Um, so what I do in practice when I'm working in the notebooks, even if it's a normal notebook, this isn't for Pidgey notebooks, I always indent my code. Because if I have like hella blocks of code, and at the end of the day, I want to actually print 20. Um, what if I were to render this untabbed, it looks like that, and it's not code. If I tab it in, it looks like code. And when I render it as a markdown cell, it looks like code. So in a lot of ways, the notebook has taught me to really program in markdown. Um, one of the features of Pidgey, if you put a URL in here that you can uh, iframe, it just shows up, right? So this becomes really nice for taking notes. Um, one of the first demos I'm gonna show you is uh, a riff off of um, Brett Victor's early work in Tangle.js, where you know, the idea is, is that you, know, you can have this object and you can change the narrative in line and update things. Now I haven't gotten quite, quite to this point of integration. And mind you, as I'm going through uh, the fancy parts of this demo, this is not, there's no JavaScript in this, it's a pure IPython kernel, um, and it's written purely in Python. So this is, this, is, this is a Python project. All right, so let's recreate this uh, demo here. And uh, what we're saying is that, hey, uh, now I can go and drag this. My Pidgey cell actually contains Jinja templates. It goes and computes this stuff for me, right? So when this widget's changing, it's actually going and updating the template. I make a little widget, and I say it's a cookie. But if you look, it's actually an emoji. Um, so that's another feature of support in Pidgey is uh, using emojis for things. Uh, what happens is the uh, emoji name gets munged into a Python alias. So we could have a baby, um, baby chick, baseball, penguin. And then uh, if we were to put all of these things together, so I added some emoji completion. That's a feature of Pidgey here. So if we put all these things together and we say this equals 10, then we now have a baby chick baseball penguin variable. Um, for me, this really helps with naming. I don't like naming. I think it's a waste of time. Uh, but nevertheless, let's move a little bit forward. So we have these Jinja templates in here. And what I thought would always be cool is if the Jinja templates could walk, hook into the IPython display formatter and give us HTML stuff, right? So we're going to uh, make a little, so basically this is a, a Pidgey cell, and we can think of it as a caption, where I'm gonna make a data frame in pandas, it's just some random data frame. Um, the figure, I'm gonna plot the figure, it's gonna go right in the Jinja template as an image. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the shape, I'm gonna show you some data frames from it, and then I'm gonna run it. So if I go and move this new output here, um, so we have a new output. Oh, that might be an old output view. Let me uh, just double check here. All right, let's, let's get new output view. All right, radical. This is my favorite part. All right, so uh, with Jinja templates, you can find out what variables they need. So I know what variables I need to re-render this. And I know that if data frame changes, then I'm gonna go keep re-rendering it. So what's really cool is without JavaScript, and just using Python and the IPython shell and the IPython kernel, we actually, we actually have like nonlinear interactivity. Like the code will update as you change stuff. Um, and this not only goes for the display, but if we think about doc testing, it's a really great literate programming interface for writing tests, right? Where it's just like, let's mix some narrative and let's mix some code together. So I've actually put 
uh, testing as a first class citizen in um, Pidgey. So now it says, oh, F is not defined. Of course it's not defined. This is a doc test that says, oh, F should return a value of one. So let's go ahead and say F returns a value of 10. And we run this. So now our doc test goes and updates. It says that it got 10, it expected one. We can go and change this. And now we get a check mark and we're satisfied. So Pidgey has a lot of affordances and ideas into it, but a lot of the main goal is to strengthen the narrative. This is not about code. We'll turn it into code later on. Uh, my favorite thing in this recently has been adding the emoji support. Um, we can import pandas as panda face using or as a real emoji. Um, we can uh, make all of these different names of things and you know it winds up adding a splash of color right and we can write these like cryptic little poetic uh, code statements that actually execute some code. Now this isn't just for Python. We want to work in all the languages. That's what's super cool about Markdown, right? Like at some point, we should be able to take advantage of all the kernels and have Pidgey doing smart stuff with all the kernels. But until then, we do have a Lisp flavor. So you can actually write a liter literate Lisp and learn how to play around with Lisp. This is using Hi, uh, which is a Python uh, flavored Lisp. Um, so this is another feature. Uh, the testing features go a little bit further, in fact. Um, so uh, we, we allow for doc testing in here. Um, the check marks indicate a successful test. Uh, we can run cells um, and they will continue running even if they get a test failure, which is super important because some notebooks might be about a failure. We can use emojis in our test. We can test functions. Um, we can test uh, unit test classes and so on and so forth. Um, but this is a lot. Pidgey does a lot of things. It's super fun. I hope to make some good getting started docs at some point. But one of my favorite outcomes of this <coughs> is that all of your markdown becomes a program. It becomes a test. So uh, I really like this project do it uh, for task, ex task execution. Um, so if you look, it says with Pidgey Loader, uh, this is context manager from task import star. I actually have a file called tasksmd. All of the indented stuff is code. So this is a literate markdown program. This just runs Python. It works as a Python script. And I find it really helpful when I'm working at this heavy, heavy interface of language and code that these abilities to weave narrative and code together become very, very important for me communicating my narrative, not only to myself, but to my colleagues. Uh, so I'm going to stop there. That was uh, the Pidgey demo. Um, and uh, I can share any links or whatever, but um, thank you for letting me share that with you all. Thank you so much for sharing. That was like high speed. So much happened. I have so many thoughts and questions, but I so many things happen. I love yeah, right. The future people. has a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> anyone else have a overwhelming? thoughts or maybe not overwhelmed maybe y'all were great you're all so cool i feel like i saw a lot of faces that kind of like had like the pinched brows and like the like the hand on the chin so i feel like there has to be questions here besides me there, there are no i, I, I talk to tony kind of regularly i don't want to push you all i'm just saying i, I yeah <laughs> if any you know i'll start out if anybody is like why on earth would you do this? I can try and answer that, but for the most part, like I think that's the biggest question. Um, but you know, I want to be able to talk and code at the same time, like a guitarist in a band plays the guitar and sings at the same time, right? So I need these deep, deep combinations of code and narrative to be able to do that. And this is kind of an evolution of the notebook because we have markdown cells and we have code cells, but now we can bring them tighter together um, and tell cooler, yes, LSP nightmare. Absolutely an LSP nightmare. And so, I mean, to that, to that point, I, I you know, created my own question. Um, one of the things that we were talking about on JEP72, um, many kernels introduce syntax that does not work with their host language. 
And uh, Pidgey is, is just an extremely extreme case of that. It doesn't put it in notebook metadata, but otherwise it's, it's, it's insane. Um, and formalizing, if a kernel could report the nature of its broken syntax that it provides and you know, round trip transformations uh, at the token level, at the line level back and forth, we could start doing some of this stuff in a more automated fashion. Like right now, we support a bunch of um, IPython magics by hand uh, in TypeScript, which is not where we want them to live. Um, but you know that at the at the end of this, there might be something to that of polyglot documents that their runtimes themselves actually tell you what makes them broken and how to unbreak them in the case of uh, static analysis, in the case of testing, in the case of packaging, right? Because we, we, I don't think we, have we actually shipped any package notebooks? I think we took it out. I think we took them out. I think we- In I think what? Uh, I don't know, anything. But, you know, with, with import and being- Yeah, it's about the only, well, I, but I thought we took it out. Like we, we pre-process. Anyhow, we want to ship notebooks, right? Like all these complaints about how on whatever they are, I mean, at the end of it, if you crack open the docs for your file and, oh, it's a friggin' notebook that you can run and it's got examples and it's got narrative, I mean, I want that more than, you know, Sphinx output. So um, these are all these are all kind of these future things. And and where we really want to get to with Pidgey is, is Prosmere. Um, you know, when we start defining some of those Jinja templates and things like that, where you drop into something that looks like Word. You know, that's again for the next billion people, right? Like a blank, a blank document that's blinking at you that is not going to start throwing pink salmony text at you as soon as you type the wrong character is is really empowering. Um, and and we've been you know tracking the nature of learning computational thought or whatever for a couple of years now, and it's. I don't, I don't know if any languages are really moving it forward. You know, it's, it's a UI problem. It's not really a code problem. Um, so we're uniquely positioned to do something about that. Yeah, I think to, one of the points to highlight there is like, we want this to be a word processor. We want word processors with compute behind them. Uh, I think scientists need that, right? Like we can't tell stories without data and code now. We have too much of it. Yeah, all of the above. Oh, geez. Uh, did the, anybody uh, see that? Go ahead. A quick question. Are you, what's the Jupyter cell type that you're saving? Are you saving raw cell or is it saving as code or markdown when it knows or what if it's mixed? So it's really leveraging the interactive shell, right? Like I've got a bunch of cleanup transformers and ask parsers and compiler sort of things that happen in there. But at the end of the day, it goes through the transformation process. The code gets run. If the first line of the cell isn't blank, then it just makes a markdown display. Um, and I have these markdown displays that uh, are sort of like widget lists where they use the traitlets and the IPython display handle to update themselves. So they're just normal to markdown displays. Um, and so are the tests. The tests are also markdown displays. So basically after the code, the code runs, the execution comes out. So you might, and this flow is important because if you get a figure, then you can almost consider your input cell as a caption, right? If you did it the other way, then it breaks the caption uh, sort of convention. So you get your display and then you get the markdown display out of it. And uh, yeah, we're not doing anything really weird. It's just code set. It's, if it's a code cell, it runs. Um, and that's one of the conventions that Pidgey brings too, which is like, instead of having code cells and markdown cells, we have on and off cells now, right? Um, where a markdown cell doesn't execute and a code cell just executes. Yeah, I was just thinking from the format save, like if you were to take a Pidgey file and load it in load it in classic or lab, but without Pidgey, what it would look like. Oh yeah, it would it would render perfectly fine. Uh the code wouldn't the code wouldn't compute though. Um in some cases you might, you know, just get the IPython text wrapper, um, like that's not trusted. Uh but yeah, you can use this without a Pidgey kernel. You can actually use a bunch of the magics and stuff like that. So, you know, it works in Interact, it works in Classic, it works in Lab, 
Um, and in fact, uh, you can act, it actually turns the Markdown editor in Jupyter Lab into a really awesome IDE because the Markdown editor already has line selections and you can shift enter on those. So you can basically be writing side by side and it's a super fabulous like literate programming experience. Yeah, the one thing missing there is the same thing from the RTC thing where we don't, our, our markdown renderer has no idea where its source is. It has, there's no way to jump back to it, again, on the LSP thing. But uh, getting the sync scrolling um, between a Pidgey source or between an RTC document and what you're doing, I think would be really massive. I, I looked into it for uh, the JupyterLab markup thing that Angus started. Um, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. Uh, your, your parser really uh, has to know a lot about what's in your code to, to get that, that kind of resolution, but it would be massively helpful. Yeah, while all of this stuff looks sort of wild, I'm actually not breaking rules. <laughs> I tried to stick as much to the uh, standards as, as I could, and if, it didn't, if there wasn't a standards approach, I didn't choose uh, that feature in, the, in Pidgey. Constraints do make more interesting designs. Yeah. Also, I don't know if we really went over how you you were using the like interactive widget on a web page that you had embedded in the notebook. There were a lot of things there, but <laughs> there were, there <laughs> before were. duplicating it below. But um, yeah, we are we are getting a little closer to time, but we obvious I think we still have time for discussion. But any any other thoughts with that? People have been very friendly. I want to know where people on uh, uh, in this room sit on emojis as variables. I'd love to have that discussion because I think naming is only a problem if you say it is. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, we've had that since, you know, APL and Fortran and stuff like, right? Like, there, there's no reason we can't have mathematical symbols. You know, that's that's how you get the that's how you get the the pocket protector crowd involved. But, you know, the emojis really resonate with a lot of people from a, a linguistic point of view. They are, for whatever reason, you know, kind of internationally uh, accepted. And I, I think it's a, I, I think they're. I think they're fine. I mean, if that's the message you want to be telling that day, you know, um, and uh, yeah, I'd love a Jupiter emoji font. That'd be great. Yeah, I definitely think emojis should be allowed to be supported, even if standard conventions say don't use this. I don't think they should be blocked from being used as a in in coding. Though I personally believe that they shouldn't be in coding. <laughs> I don't think anything should stop users from using them if they want to. It's tough is accepting people. We want to be like, you should use this, but it's like, I, I mean, it still makes me cringe, right? I'm never going to put it in my real code, but in my notebooks and the things that I present to people, I, I can't look cute physically, but I can at least make my notebooks look cute. Yeah, it could definitely flavor up uh, presentations at conferences and stuff. That would be, very entertaining, especially in the not in-person conferences that we will probably still continue to have for at least six to nine more months. Mm -hmm. I feel like you kind of just said, like, you can't write code or can't demo without being cute. And I, I think that's a fun sentiment. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. I it's sounding kind of like we're winding down a little, but maybe I'm wrong. Last bursts of inspiration. You've been visited by a muse from on high. This is your moment. Oh, I don't know I if anybody to... saw the Draw.io uh, update that, who is it, Carlos is working on? I don't know, somebody posted that on Twitter today, but that's pretty exciting. They've got RTC Draw.io draw demo moving along. That that's a nice. very exciting piece of technology. Um, I wanted to restate what um, one of the things that Frederick said, which is there is a um, 
release candidate of IPy kernel version 6 and it supports debugging and if this is something you have any interest in please pip install dash dash pre IPy kernel to get that release candidate version and play with it in Jupyter Lab 3 which will automatically enable the debugger once it detects you have a debuggable kernel and uh, this is shiny and new and hopefully fun so try it out We can add more stuff to Pidgey now. <laughs> more things. Oh, thanks for finding that, uh, Steve. I was looking for that. <laughs> I was looking for it too. Thanks for yeah. finding it, Steve. Great. Well, it's sounding like we're kind of, oh gosh, where are my notes? We're, we're, we're kind of, we've got all our info here. We got so much info today. Thank you everyone, not only for showing up, but for sharing so many different things happening. I love to see what's happening here. That's why I love to do these calls. So I hope that's why you love to be here though. If you do have thoughts on that, we actually have a feedback form, um, which you can give as soon as I get my life together and link this. And that is now in the chat. But I also want to say if this was your first time, extra welcome to you. And if you haven't shared before, if you have, I hope you've seen we have a real range of shares and like presentation styles here. It doesn't have to be sometimes people have an idea of polished, I think, and it doesn't have to be. That's totally up to your comfort level and how you feel okay sharing. But if you do, I do already have an agenda for next month if you want to sign up for that as well. It's there whenever you are ready. And our next community call will be on. July 27th, I should double check that. Yes, I was correct this time. So that'd be great. If anyone also ever wants to run these calls, I'm gonna continue extending that. I love to run them. You don't have to do it alone, but it's probably better if more than one person knows what's happening. So that's that's my little I, I, spiel at the end. And you oh, have it a does bunch need of to be updated, you're right. Thank you, it's and, been a weird week. <laughs> and you have a bunch of, uh, resources for getting started with these events too that like if folks do want to start these there's they're not getting started from scratch anymore right yes no i i, I was actually thinking the next time i may share those because they've kind of been work in progress but i i think they're working because these calls keep happening so <laughs> i may share those more publicly so yeah thanks for noticing that needed updating y'all i'm gonna do that right now and yes, that's good to know that it may overlap with things. So thanks for letting me know, Claudia. And I will stop recording now, actually, as I'm continuing to mess things up. There we go. Thank